All right, guys, I'm gonna talk about five different things that you need to train on as an individual, as your individual responsibility to be a well-rounded asset. So let's go ahead and jump right into it and let's roll the intro. Hey guys, thanks for checking out another HatchetCast episode. And today we're gonna to be talking about five different categories you should be training on and considering if you wanna be a well-rounded asset that are individual responsibilities that really help the overall group. If you haven't done so already, before we get started, hit the like and subscribe button. Also hit the notification bell. Also, if you wanna support the channel further, you can always go and sign up for our subscription program where we're gonna have episodes specifically for members, such as like training type of videos and build outs and load out videos, things that we can't actually show here on our YouTube channel. Those are gonna be available to the members as well as some other things that will be perks of being a member including member only type of training events. So um, make sure you guys go check that out if you wanna support the channel even more. But let's go ahead and jump right into it. Um, so today we're gonna to be talking about five different categories that you should be training on or considering if you wanna be a well-rounded asset to your team. So one time I was uh, you know, working with some Green Beret dudes that were uh, on this exercise and if you haven't learned about the Green Beret contract, it's really, really interesting. I think it's actually probably the most beneficial type of construct that would work towards like a prepared citizen type of group. Um, but the Green, Green Beret's team leader, their team sergeant asked me, he came up to me because I was gonna be the, the JTAC for their team. And he said, hey, what assets or what skills do you have? And I was like, oh, well, I'm a JTAC. He's like, no, no, no what life skills do you bring to the team outside of obviously your military job? Um, and, and that kind of struck a tone with me and made me think about like all of the skills that I have as an individual that I've learned in life, all my trade skills could come to uh, benefit the team. Uh, so we're gonna talk more about the skills though that you should know um, as an individual when it comes to being an asset to your team and being well-rounded. So in a Green Beret team, the way that they have their construct is they have every team member has a specific skill set. So like the weapon sergeant is in charge of training firearms. He's in charge of defense of the team's base. He helps train up indigenous forces in, in shooting and small unit tactics and CQB and all that stuff. The medical guy, yeah, or the Delta, he is the medic for the team. So he is an expert in the medical realm. The Charlie is your explosives guy and construction dude. So he's like the engineer of the team. Uh, but all of the team members within that team all have a baseline set of skills that every single member trains on. And that are these different categories, uh, you know, like shooting and small unit tactics and you know stopping the bleed, um, you know, communications. They all have a general knowledge that they can operate all of those different things or conduct those different skills um, even though they have a specific job, if that makes sense. So like these are just your baseline set of things that you want to be training on just so that way you can be an asset. And then obviously you have your trade or your specific skill set that is your life trade skill that you can bring to the team. So let's go ahead and jump right into that. Um, this list does get sort of long, so here we go. Shooting, all right, so this is the one that's a really, really good, um, shooting is definitely the most exciting out of all the skills, and um, I enjoy it, obviously, because I make a living, you know, teaching firearms and things of that nature. So this is my favorite uh, category. Um, but whenever you're considering firearm skills, you should be considering multiple different things. One, I think that you should also be obviously of your pistol and your rifle skills. So like your carbine, your fighting rifle, or your, you know, whether it's a piston, you know, direct impingement gas system, it doesn't matter. Your main squeeze, your main rifle that you use, having the skills to be able to operate that safely and effectively and be really good as a rifleman. The other one is obviously your pistol, your sidearm. Um, that is a different tool for different types of applications. And it's important to not just look at that 
pistol as like, oh, it's just my emergency backup. I think we've had this, this negative outlook on the pistol of and just assuming the only thing this is good for is concealed carry and a backup weapon in case my rifle goes down. Yes, it does. That is one role that the pistol can fulfill. So the pistol really does fulfill a lot of roles. It's, it's like the Phillips head uh, screwdriver in comparison to a flathead, you know what I'm saying? Like you have, pistols can be good for detaining a subject, uh, be good for clearing a small space, could be good for if I need my other hand to be free and I need something smaller to be able to manipulate but still cover for security. Um, there's tons of different applications that pistols are great for, but one of the applications just happens to be it can be used as a backup, backup pistol, so or a backup weapon. So, um, being proficient with a pistol and with a rifle is extremely important. And by proficient, meaning safety is the baseline. Like you are naturally safe. You don't have to constantly think about safety. You're just naturally safe. Like you, it's almost like a reflex. You don't have to worry about your safety being flipped on, if it's on or not. It's automatically on whenever you're done shooting. Um, you know, your pistols or your rifles always point in a safe direction, no matter what. Your finger's always off the trigger whenever you're not shooting. You're following those four firearm safety rules so much and so well, it's a reflex being safe, right? Your safety is is paramount. Um, so the other thing also that's good to consider is like other weapon systems. So like for example, um, you know, training on different type of weapon systems just to be familiar at the very least. Like an AK platform, if you run a uh, you know an AR-15, you practice on your AK or practice with an AK or a Galil or. Um, you know, some common type of items, a shotgun, like how many guys know how to use a shotgun? Uh, so running a shotgun, a uh, pump and a, and a semi-automatic shotgun. Those types of things are important to at least familiarize yourself. So that way you can pick up that weapon system. You're already naturally safe. You know the four firearm safety rules and you practice them like blinking. Um, it's so natural, but you're able to operate other type of weapon systems if you have them. The other thing is also like long range, um, you know, practicing with a bolt gun, knowing the fundamentals of shooting distance, how to shoot distance with a carbine, and then also how to shoot distance with a, uh, a, a bolt action rifle. Those types of things of being able to engage targets that are at further distances and having the fundamentals down to where I can, I know how to range, I know how to read in mills, I know how to dial, I know how to hold, I, I can I can roughly read winds pretty decent, um, I know what dope is, uh, I know the dope for my gun. These are all things that if you're wanting to be an asset, broadening your skill sets in the shooting category makes you very flexible. So what that does is all these different categories and these baseline skills makes you more flexible and more of an asset to the group because you can accept different types of responsibilities. Um, you know, say for example, something happens, the guy who's the, the marksman for the group, he's down, he's out, uh, or he's sick or whatever, you can pick up that slack and be like, hey man, I can fulfill that role. Uh, and so that's what all these different categories do is having the the knowledge, baseline knowledge, and all these different skill sets makes you more of an asset. So the more skill sets that you have, the more flexibility that team leader has for the group to be able to do more stuff, right? It makes you a more capable unit. Uh, so, you know, making sure that you're training and training how to be proficient with a firearm, not just proficient, but also like, you know, your main squeeze, your main battle rifle and your main pistol, you're very, very proficient with those. You're very proficient at, you know, distant shooting and, and being able to work and engage targets far out. Um, you're also really good at observing, like how to identify and PID targets, PID hostiles versus non-hostiles, um, knowing when to make that risk assessment of should I take the shot, should I not take the shot. Uh, being able to talk guns, like if they say, hey, let's go, we're going to talk guns for SUT, you know what that means and you know how to do that. You know how to control the rate of fire. You know how to quickly reload so that way if you go empty or if you guys are in the middle of a fight and you, your weapon goes down, you can get that thing back up as fast as possible so that way you can continue to be an effective person on the team. Those are all great skill sets to have in that shooting category. Um, and obviously, if you have um, the ability or know somebody that can even like you know, go into MGs, and, and that's something actually we've talked about doing on the uh, on the members only segment is is teaching how to work through the manual of arms for MGs, um, and that's something that we definitely 
have talked about doing. I think it's good to know so that way when you pick it up, at least you're somewhat familiar and then you can actually be able to work that weapon system if it's something that becomes available to you. All right, so that's covering the shooting portion. Um, the next one is gonna be probably a very important skill set, even more so than shooting, just because you can actually have the opportunity to practice this in real life, and that is medical training. Uh, medical training is always not that fun. I, I enjoy it because I enjoy learning, but it's not as sexy as shooting, all right? So, unless you are, you know, a fan of medicine. Uh, medical skills, should include obviously outside just tourniquets, but we have a medical course that we uh, have with Guardian Casualty Response, um, and um, or excuse me, not, uh, Guardian Angel Consulting, and they have a course called Guardian Casualty Response. Um, this is a stop the bleed course. It's very in depth. It pretty much takes um, you know some more of the advanced medical courses that cost a lot of money and they and we really condense it into the meat and potatoes of what you need to know and then have skill stations and a scenario that we involve in that course. Todd is an incredible instructor and the great thing about Todd when it comes to Guardian Casualty Response course is he is extremely passionate, like he's a nerd about medicine. He absolutely loves everything about medicine. So it's always good to learn a skill set from somebody who absolutely is it just loves it. Like I absolutely love shooting. Um, I love everything about it. I, it's pretty much all I talk about. I get super jazzed up whenever um, it's time to talk about shooting or guns or anything of that nature or whenever we're training in classes, I get super fired up. So, um, you know, learning from people who are absolutely fascinated with the subject that you're learning about is, is key. So Todd is definitely one of those people who is fascinated with medicine. He loves it. He talks about it all the time. That's all he, he studies. Um, so make sure you guys take a guardian casualty response course whenever we have it up on the schedule, which we will have those soon. But medical skills, um, some things that you might want to consider, stopping the bleed. Where do I have, what do I have in my IFAC? Can I use everything in my individual first aid kit? Do I know how to use it? Um, knowing how to also do different types of expedient litters, like how do I have where I need to transport a casualty from point A to point B? How do I do that besides just drag him by his plate carrier handle? Do I have any tubular webbing I can use to make a litter? I can use that to help transport a casualty. Um, you know, understanding how to also operate a actual litter, like a Skedco or a straight backboard. How do I implement those things and become a um, asset to anybody that could be a casualty on my team? The other thing also is, you know, going through, you know, March, like understanding the acronyms for providing that that first line of care for the casualty that you have and how do I continue to provide them care until we can move them to a higher level of care. And then the other thing is also, like there's nothing wrong with learning a little bit more than just stop the bleed where you can now, you can be put into a position where now that medic can give you a little bit more responsibilities where you can be his assistant. Now I'm assisting the group even more by allowing me to have, the team to have a bigger medical capability um, and so, you know, expounding upon those medical skills, I think is gonna be really important, but you need to know the basics. Um, you know, the other thing is also like, attribute of a good ca casualty collection point. What, how, do I, how do I establish that? What do I need to have there? Um, what does the medic need to have there so that way I can be an asset to him? So those, those are definitely things that you should be thinking about. Guess what guys, the Ranger Handbook is an awesome tool to use and it's an awesome tool to have. They update it all the time. There's tons of resources out there, there really is. Um, to include the amount of courses that we are able to take now and the access to metal equipment that we can buy as a regular uh, citizen. So. Definitely look into your medical skills. It is definitely important. If you like being alive and staying alive and helping your friends stay alive, it's definitely something that's important. You can also use it in real world scenarios. You know, Roy's actually had an, a boating accident that he happened to be a witness of that he was able to provide medical attention to that individual and get them to a higher level of care and was able to actually stop a pretty horrendous wound, a bleeding wound. So um, it does, it does matter, it is important, so make sure you guys go get medical skills. The other one is also navigation. So like, how do I get from point A to point B, right? So understanding um, how to use a Garmin or a GPS, a handheld GPS, how do I read a map? Um, am I able to plot coordinates in 
Military Grid Reference System, or MGRS, can I plot coordinates in latitude, longitude, or lat long? Um, am I able to use a compass? Can I orient my map based off my settings so that way I know where the heck I'm at? Or if I'm gonna be the point man and I'm leading the group to an objective, can I get them there? All right. Um, another thing is not just can I get them there, but can I circumnavigate any obstacles or danger areas or uh, circumnavigate really rough terrain so that way the team's not going through the thickest part of the, the woods or going through bodies of water. And by the time we get there, we're combat ineffective because I led them through the thickest stuff and now everybody's tired and wet and exhausted and some equipment's damaged because of the water or I lost something or there's a cliff face so now we got to figure out how to rappel down it. And it's like, you could have circumnavigated that if you had actually you know, known how to read maps. Making sure that you have a, a good understanding about navigation. Um, the other thing also is I may not just have to navigate to, from point A to point B, but can I plot points? So if someone gives me grid coordinates, can I plot those points for enemy targets, for known and, you know, routes of travel, um, for an objective? Can I plot those points? Can I find out the distance between two different points? Uh, a great resource is actually CalTopo, C-A-L, topo.com and you can actually get a paid version and the free version but you can print off maps and put MGRS or military grid reference system grids um, on to those maps you can get satellite imagery you can get standard map imagery you can get the topography of the area um, it's a great resource to have so go check out Cal Topo. the other thing is if you're running ATACs like there's a civilian version of ATACs now then it helps you with also you know battle tracking or being able to plot different people's positions and see where they're at that is a huge deal especially when you're trying to battle track different areas so like say for example if I'm in an area where I know there's an enemy presence and I plot all those different points, but I also, uh, you know, there's another friendly unit that's going to go do some missions in that area and I don't know where in that area they're going and they end up coming back, you know, are we going to end up fratriciding our own guys because we lost essay about where they were, they didn't, we didn't have their frontline trace or their position. So having the ability to battle track and know where people are at requires you to be able to navigate, know navigation, know how to plot grids, know how to use all the things involving navigation. Um, you know, the other thing is also how to read a compass. Can I read a compass at night? Can I read a compass during the day? Um, you know, what are some tricks for making sure that I can use my bezel ring to be able to plot a different uh, azimuth or um, doing a back azimuth? These are all important things that we need to consider and things that you should already have knowledge on as a asset who's well-rounded to the team. So now we're going to move on to battlefield technology skills. And this, this is, I'm kind of taking all of these different types of technology and I'm putting it into one category. Um, there should be a general use knowledge of all the different types of things that you may have on your body. So one of them would be night vision. I'm going to talk about night vision real quick. And that is if you are wanting to train with night vision, like for example, baseline stuff like shooting. If you want to be able to shoot under night vision, you need to have the skill set for that during the day, like you figure out the more consistent you are in your daytime shooting regimen, you know, coming to my workspace whenever I'm reloading, clearing malfunctions, coming to my natural point of aim and putting that stock in the same exact spot every time, being able to find the optic every time, being able to find the dot whenever I'm shooting a pistol with a red dot, like being safe, all of these things are extremely paramount to have a solid understanding and a solid knowledge about and skill set in whenever you are doing it during the day because when you put it under night vision, you won't be able to see. Like, you'll be able to see what's around you, but you're not going to adjust your tube to focus on your rifle to, to reload it. It's all going to be through feel and muscle memory and repetition. So. You have to establish all that during the daytime. Um, so if you're not proficient with a firearm during the day, you're definitely not going to be proficient at night under night vision. So make sure you're training when you're at the range and you're thinking about you know, doing your, your drills or whatever, or reloads or, or malfunction training or whatever, anything that involves firearms, make sure you are proficient during the day, do the exact same thing, be consistent every single time. So that way when you put on night vision, it's a lot easier and you're actually more effective than somebody who 
doesn't really know how to shoot and just thinks that I can buy night vision and be all of a sudden, you know, soap from Call of Duty. Like, it's just not realistic. So make sure you have an understanding of your shooting skills and have mastered daytime shooting skills before you start transitioning over to night vision. Otherwise, you're gonna get frustrated or be a walking detriment to your team. So with night vision though, you also need to make sure you understand all of the different features of your specific night vision. Um, all the different IR signaling devices that you have that work under night vision. Um, how to adjust my my uh, my tube so that way I can uh, focus on different things or focus on things that are far away. How do I adjust the the uh, diopters at the rear so that way it's set for my eye specifically? Do I know how to turn on the IR mode? Do I know how to turn the IR mode off where it's just not a big IR floodlight on my face? Um, these are all important things when it comes to night vision that you should do and train at home that you can get familiar with. Can I put my night vision up and then bring it down without having to feel around? Can I adjust it on my face with my rhino mount without having to fumble around the whole time trying to figure out where the different buttons are at? Um, you know, making sure that I tie off my night vision to my helmet so if it drops for whatever reason, it doesn't fall and I lose it forever. Uh, these, these are some things that you can practice at home and it costs you no money. Uh, outside the night vision costs you money, but uh, the practice of those skill sets don't cost you money. And that's why in our night vision alpha class, we practice daytime skills at night. We, we go walking in the woods, we learn how to hide from you know roving patrols, we'll actually have an op four vehicle looking for us on our walk, so that way we have to learn how to hide, how to turn it off, how to be able to move them up out of the way, make sure that the lenses aren't being reflected off of headlights from guys running flashlights trying to find us. Um, that's what we practice in the alpha class with some shooting and things of that nature, but doing daytime skills, living life that we do, you know, life skills that we have during the day and doing them at, at night under nods. The other thing I'm gonna put in this category is also like your radios. So understanding how to program your own radio, how to, you know, learn the brevity, if there's brevity code words for us to use for certain things in our group, that tactic or technique that we have, What's that brevity? Memorizing that brevity. Um, you know, knowing how to push to talk, not push to think. So I'm not gonna push my push to talk and go, uh, and, and just wait there forever, wasting up time and also giving away my position. You know, if somebody has the ability to find that radio signal and then, you know, triangulate on that, I don't wanna be that guy or be that person that's going to give away important information on, on an unsecured radio network, uh, you know, which that's why brevity is there. So, you know, making sure that you can program your radios, make, you know, try different antennas, learn how to build antennas, you can, know, you can help out the guy who is the radio dude for this team. And one, be able to program your own radios and also know the brevity. If there's a brevity, you know, list that is built for your group that kind of help you stay a little bit under uh, the radar, not have to be uh, worried about you know, speaking always on secure comms, because if anybody, if somebody hears that, and you're talking in your brevity, they have no idea what the heck you're talking about. So um, that's where brevity really becomes important and can be very helpful for you. The other thing is with ATACs, we have the civilian version of ATACs, and um, I may have already talked about this, but you can battle track on ATACs. Uh, the other thing is, I'm not sure if you have the ability to be able to hook it to radios where if I talk on the radio, I can actually populate on that ATAX map is for battle tracking. Um, but if you have it, you should be able to know how to use your ATAX system. Um, now, something that's become really, really big in warfare and combat nowadays is drones. Um, a lot of guys are using DJI drones or making their own drones or using FPV drones to do all kinds of different things, use it for all different kinds of roles. For here in the States, obviously, we can use it for like recce. We can use it to kind of find where things are at. You can send that drone out ahead to be able to see if there's any threats before you walk into an area, kind of recon that out. You can use it to you know, look for stuff, all different kinds of applications for drones uh, that you can use. But the key is, is you know, knowing how to use the drone, obviously, just basic understanding of how to, to use it, uh, using it safely, but also knowing when to use it, how much noise can I mitigate when I'm using it, um, how high does it have to be before, um, I don't hear the drone at all. 
uh, different types of things that it comes to drones, you know, making sure I have enough batteries, how long is my flight time, am I a good pilot, especially with FPV drones, those guys are insane and uh, really, really cool how they use those drones nowadays and it's very, very lethal. I think drones are going to be something that are of the future that is really going to be an important role in warfare. So we're already seeing that. Uh, I think it's going to become even more prevalent, um, you know, as we move forward. Uh, through history. Now the other thing that's also really important is obviously driving skills. Having the skill sets to be able to drive, know how to use four by, you know, a four-wheeler or go into four-wheel drive on your vehicle, how to navigate different terrain, but knowing how to drive different vehicles is going to be really important. Even if you know how to use like excavators and stuff of that nature, maybe that's your life trade, but having skill set in different types of vehicles or just a basic understanding of how to drive evasively uh, I think will be very important. Something else that, you know, obviously it's kind of a nerd thing to think about, but computer skills, um, having PowerPoint skills, Word, if you're going to build a concept of operation slide for your group or a brief or, you know, typing up an equipment list for your group, um, typing up, you know, a radio code sheet that you're going to have, your brevity list, uh, being proficient with computer skills and just basic stuff is going to be helpful. You'll find that you will actually probably use those skills amongst your group. So having some basic uh, skills when it comes to uh, your computer stuff is important as well. And the other one is also camera skills. Like if you know how to use a camera, setting up a hunting camera so that we can use that to kind of watch your perimeter or you can use it for security, where to place those hunting cameras, where to use an actual regular camera, you know, how to zoom, how to adjust the lighting so that way I get the most amount of detail from my picture. I can use it for my recce type stuff. Um, all those types of things are important. How do I kill off the flash so that way I'm not flashing whenever I'm using that camera and giving away my position. Um, you know, bringing those types of skills is a good skill set to have, but it just falls into that general category of equipment skills. Now, um, depending on your life skills that you have and your trade skills that you have, uh, you may be more versed in specific and very special equipment like a camera or uh, a drone, things of that nature that you can actually bring to the group, driving skills, etc. And then the last one I'm going to talk about is small unit tactics and, and just tactics in general. You should have a basic understanding of different types of movement, so like formations, different hand signals in case you guys want to go hand signals and not under, uh, use radio comms, um, you know, how to establish a casualty collection point, how to do a tactical road march, how to do basic CQB, and also understand like, or just fighting in urban warfare and urban combat, you know, staying, staying out of the fatal funnel, don't pop your head up in the window, you know, shoot, move, communicate. Those basic SUT or small unit tactics type skills are going to be extremely vital and important that you have an understanding of that as an individual because you're going to be doing group movements. So if you're that one guy, you have no idea what's going on and we're going into a wedge formation and you're just kind of walking around, obviously you are not being an asset to the group. Now the group has to figure out where to place you. You don't know the, the, the drill to do if you guys react to contact or trying to break contact or bounding away. Uh, so having a, a good understanding of small unit tactics at an individual level will overall help the group and make you more effective as a unit. So, Make sure you go get a Ranger Handbook. It's super, super important. Um, it's like the Bible. They update it every few years, uh, and they have all different types of you know information in there. Um, you know, convoy operations. You know, CQB basics, uh, small unit tactics. Uh, even some radio stuff in there. You don't have obviously the specific individual equipment when it comes to the radios, but you can use the, the theory, antenna theory, and the different types of things that they are talking about in that book. Uh, there's just, just tons of resources in there. I'm also going to group in uh, survival skills with SUT and the reason why it's a actual skill set that you have to learn, um, it's field craft. Uh, so understanding how to start a fire, how to make an evasion fire, so where I can make a spider hole fire, where I can make it super small, doesn't give off any signature, uh, but at the same time I'm able to heat up my food, I can, I can you know, be an asset to the group. If I am alone, I can stay alive. Uh, figuring out what foods to eat, what not to eat, how to purify my water, uh, those basics. You know, the basics of bundling up and making sure I'm, I'm layering my clothes properly if it gets cold or hot. Those things make you an asset, because if you're taking care of yourself and you know how to survive, but also you're taking care of your body, 
that means the group does not have to worry about you going down because as soon as you become a casualty because you fail to take care of yourself or your failure to layer properly or uh, not keep your feet dry, those things become a detriment to the group because now they have to take care of you and the medic now has to work on you because of your negligence or just lack of knowledge in how to take care of those things. So um, understanding how to use you know, different survival skills as, as needed, even hunting. That may be something that you may have to do, dressing game and preparing food so that way you guys can eat if you guys do catch game. Uh, so make sure you're practicing your small unit tactic skills, your survival skills. There's tons of resources online that are free. You don't have to go pay thousands of dollars for a course, um, but if you do go, now there's training companies that are actually teaching small unit tactics and sustainment. Um, I'm gonna do a shout out for Orion Training Group. I've never met those guys, but what they're putting out is amazing. Another great company is Core Vision Training. Uh, so make sure you go and get the training that's proper and understand also what type of skill sets you're learning. Um, you know, are you going to a CQB course that's more geared for law enforcement, but you're trying to have more of a uh, combat type of experience in urban warfare. So, you know, tailoring your training towards what your goals are and what your needs for the group are is important. And the other thing is also, if you have a group, maybe as a group collective, you guys say, hey, uh, we're gonna you know, pull together the money and pay for you to go to this small unit tactics class. And then you're gonna bring back all that knowledge and show us what you learned. Um, you're gonna go to that CQB course and bring that knowledge back and you'll be the POC or the point of contact for teaching us to the group what you learned in that class um, or medical, et cetera, et cetera. So you guys can practice this. You can spread your funds out to be able to send different guys from your little group and your community to different training events and have them come back to teach the entire collective so you get uh, a really good experience for the group. Understand if you want the skill set specifically, it is really important for you to go to classes and go to training and go to instructors, but also diversify your training. So go to different instructors so that way you don't become an echo chamber. You know, we always tell our students like, hey, if you come take numerous classes from Barrel and Hatchet, also go take some instruction from other good instructors out there because you may learn some other things and then you as a collective start to build your own way of doing things that becomes effective for your group. So. Make sure you guys are diversifying your training, diversifying what you guys have in terms of skill sets, uh, and then also your life skills, like your actual trade skills. Bring that to the group. There may be something where if you're a mechanic, that is a huge deal for the group. Or you know, you know, you fly drones for commercial real estate, but you're really good at flying drones. Um, you know, you're good at putting together PowerPoints and doing computer skills. Well, you can be the guy that helps put together the uh, information for the concept of operations or the con op. Um, those are all really good skills to bring up to your group that you can use to make you guys more effective as a unit. So with that being said, guys, just wanted to put all that kind of stuff out there just to kind of show you, give you a kind of skeletonized baseline of what you should be training on, the different categories you should be thinking about, and how to make yourself more well-rounded. If you guys want to see more information behind the scenes about how we do things, go check out our Instagram page. We are also on X or Twitter, uh, formerly known as, and check out any of the stuff that we have coming out. We will have a newsletter coming out, so we'll let you guys know when to sign up for the newsletter. There will be information about classes and the 2024 schedule, as well as other events that we're going to have. Um, also, make sure you go check out our Spotify podcast. We haven't been posting on that for a while, but we're about to get onto a more. Roy and I are about to go full time, so we're gonna have a very regimented schedule about posting on those different outlets here soon to include the training schedule will be very regimented. Hope you guys got something out of this. If you did get something out of it, make sure you guys share it with a friend, share it with your group, and build a game plan. Build a training plan for the year, especially in 2024. It's a great time to start, build, yeah, build your New Year's resolution. Let's build a training plan for 2024 about how you guys can bring skill sets to your group and become an asset as a unit. Anyways, guys, make sure you train to be the asset, not the liability, and I will see you on the next one.